Adams uh, coming to give the lecture. And just as a background really on the project that we're going to be looking at over the next two months in, in your groups. So we've selected a flow sheet from the 3G course. Some of you may have actually used this flow sheet in your course. The reason for doing this is that it gets every group on the equal footing. So we're all going to have the same flow sheet, same mass and energy balances. And our project isn't to solve the problem that you that was described there in the 3G handout, but our, we're going to be looking at issues around economics of the process, safety, operability. So this is our, our starting point. Dr. Adams is going to give us a background a bit about why the flow sheet is structured in the way it is, some of the decisions that were made uh, in assembling it that way. And the class and time here is mainly an opportunity for you to get some of the questions that you might have when reading that handout to answer. So in the future, you won't be able to just go knock on Dr. Adam's door and just ask him why, why stuff is the way it is, right? So this is our opportunity just to get this um, out of the way right now. So Tom, thank you very much. Okay, hi everybody. I think I remember all of them. Right. <laughs> uh, we've come a long way, haven't we? many Okay, so um, yeah, Kevin, just tell me when you want to change times or change topics or whatever. So I'm pulling on the um, Okay, so I'm going to start with just like commercial context, like why the process exists, why it's important. So this is this is um, some slides from my grad course. If you stick around, you can take my course in energy systems engineering. But we're going to talk about methanol. So this was the coal and biomass to methanol process that we're talking about. Okay, so just to give you context on like methanol is a major commercial commodity. The chemical energy. So you're looking at seven, 75 million tons produced annually. Right? That's quite a bit. Um, it's a stock chemical, so it's used for all sorts of things like formaldehyde, acetic acid. Those are also stock chemicals. Um, those get used for all sorts of things later on. Right? So it's a very early in the supply chain chemical, sort of the base thing that gets used many other times. Um, our, my focus right now is really on fuel, so we're sort of moving into new fuels, alternative fuels, new ways of producing uh, diesel and gasoline, synthetics, or alternatives, that kind of thing. So that's where methanol is really starting to come into play. Um, just to show you price-wise, so we're looking at half, half a dollar to a dollar fifty a gallon, pretty stable over a decade and a half. As far as, in, so methanol is an energy molecule. And as far as energy molecules go, this is actually a very stable price structure. Okay, natural gas will go between $1 and $15 a, a million BTU, for example. But methanol stays in a pretty stable range. We have some, like, uh, you know, it's basically trending up, you know, just with inflation and other world issues. One plan outage doubled the price. So one plan in Trinidad went down and doubled the price for quite a while in 2006. This is the energy crisis of 2008. This is when everything um, tripled, quintupled in price, and then immediately crashed right after that. And then we have the housing crisis, and then we have the global recession um, right there. So other than these like sort of major world events, it even still bounced right back overall. And the reason is because it's such a huge um, competitive bulk commodity chemical. Okay. From a fuel perspective, we can use it directly as a fuel. So it's like going to go far the one, or right. So it's like it's a racing fuel. Um, but it's really more interesting from our perspective as, as commerce, uh, is not that we say, um, is how we can, we can convert it to dimethyl ether, so that's a diesel substitute, you can use it instead of diesel. Um, you can convert it to gasoline, um, or you can use it directly in a flexible fuel vehicle where you have a mixture of methanol and methanol and fusional, um, and, and some other higher alcohols as well, and uh, gasoline. So there's a number of different, different ways we can use methanol. Um, just as a fuel. So what I'm showing here, this is energy density. So basically how much energy, this is higher heating value. So it shows basically how much chemical bond energy that you can convert to uh, uh, power um, in, in the fuel. Okay, so here's gasoline. So we're at 12, 120,000 BTUs per gallon. Um, methanol is about half. Okay, so if you fill up your gas tank with methanol instead of gasoline, you can only drive half as far. So that's a huge problem. Right? This is why we don't really want to use it as a fuel um, in our gas tank, because you just can't go as far. The range is a significant difference. Um, other things that are actually nice about it is a high octane rating of 120. Uh, ethanol is 113. So your car is about 90, uh, 87 for unregular and blended, right? And so basically, oct what octane ratings do is it 
um, you just need a certain amount of, amount of uh, oxygenates in your engine. I'm going to help prevent engine knock. Um, you only need enough to hit the minimum that it's designed for, and anything above that does nothing. So if you fill up, you know, super in your regular unleaded car, it doesn't do you any good. You just pay more money. There's no mileage, there's none of those issues. Right? The only potential benefit is if that particular higher blend of gas has like a surfactant or something. Otherwise, from a fuel efficiency standpoint, it's probably worse because your engine is designed for that particular kind of fuel. Okay. So the only reason why it's nice is because regular gasoline actually has a low octane rating. You have to add stuff to bring it up higher and higher, so you can use methanol to blend. Okay. So right now, you're allowed to blend in up to five percent methanol, and which you may do just for the for the octane rating purposes. Um, you can have up to M15 in most existing cars without changing them. Um, M15 means 15% ethanol. Okay, so you're only allowed to blend in five in the United States and Canada. Okay, so originally we had used methanol in the gas industry to make methyl um, terpbutyl ethene, MTBE, which is a small reducer, so it's meant to handle like not nitrous oxide emissions, but it turns out it was highly carcinogenous, so um, they don't do that now. So that's actually why we use um, other stuff. And this, uh, that's a whole other area we we'll get into. Um, there's issues with toxicity, um, but basically as a fuel itself for your gas tank, it's not really good. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Okay, so uh, this product is making methanol from, in our case, coal or biomass. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but methanol is probably not the starting point. Okay. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip this and we'll talk about that in the process sheet. Okay, so one of the things you can convert methanol to, so like, remember, it's a beginning chemical, right? One of these is called dimethyl ether. Okay, so dimethyl ether is basically a diesel substitute, but also compared to diesel has half the energy density, which, which does stink, right? That's another issue. Um, but for long haul trucks, um, it's less of, a, less of a big deal to have a bigger gas tank on a long haul truck with more space. Um, the C tank number, we'll get into that, but it's basically the same. It just means it's directly comparable to the diesel engine. That has to do with firing times and how long it takes to get a spark after it. <coughs> um, but the, the reason why it's nice is you can, you can just use it directly in your engine. Um, Non-carcinogenic, non-toxic um, has some viscosity differences, so you need a different fuel injection system. But the reason why this is nice is because you don't need a lot of changes to directly use it. Okay, and from an emissions standpoint, um, it's actually much lower emissions in almost every category that, that we track. So red would be like standard diesel, blue is dimethyl ether. Um, so in raw hydrocarbon emissions, so this would be like methane that's un unreacted, that gets sent to the atmosphere. Methane is 25 times worse than CO2 for global warming. Um, it smells bad and it's, and it's not good, right? No, it's a way lower. Um, carbon monoxide, so that's half. So carbon monoxide is what is poisonous, it can kill you. Right? Um, Half of that, no smoke whatsoever. So in terms of like particulates and that kind of thing, the smog form is way, way lower. Okay, so from an environmental perspective, just in terms of what's actually comes out of the back of the diesel truck, um, even though you can only you have to keep refilling more frequently, um, this is on a per um, yeah per mile basis actually. So it's still better from an environmental perspective. Okay. So that's that's pretty nice. Okay, so there's a good reason for it. And basically, you, you make it from methanol. So there's many different ways to do it, but your flow sheet is going to be, you're basically you're going to make syngas, so hydrogen CO ratio I'll talk in a minute. That's converted to methanol. All right, and, that's your, and then you pretty much end here, and then we can convert this to dimethyl ether, and then recover the dimethyl ether. Separation. Okay, and there's many competitors to this, but the basic idea is we have, um, Four hydrogens and two COs, you get one dimethyl ether. Okay, so it's like one, two, three, four, five, six here. Our two carbons come from here, and then we have a whole water waste. Okay, and it's ex slightly exothermic overall, which means you lose energy as you go. Okay. So some of the energy you started with is lost to heat. Okay, and the main DME synthesis is basically two methanols, gives you one dimethyl ether, and that's where the water comes out. You just stick them together, water comes out. Put the oxygen in the center. Okay, so um, I won't go into all these details, but there's a bunch going on based on your ratios of what your sin gas is. There's some optimal ratio to get dimethyl ether. That's basically what we're talking about. Let's get this. Um, 
you know, I guess more details we don't need to go into. But basically, again, we're starting with our syndas, making it, separating it. Everything is just reaction separation. It's all kind of engineering. It's easy, right? Okay, so the other, the other major thing is the methanol to gasoline. So this has been ongoing for quite some time, for about two, uh, two or three decades. Okay, and this is basically, we can take methanol, if we can make it cheaply, we can make um, you know, fuel grade gasoline, so for your car as is. Okay, so basically the step is to first make dimethyl ether. So once you've made that, part of that you can sell for the diesel substitute. And the rest is you have a special catalyst which converts the dimethyl ether into paraffins. Okay, so paraffins are like um, your octane, epithelium, that kind of stuff. The bulk of what you want in your fuel. But you also get, okay, this is what you're getting as a function of residence time. So uh, basically you're producing, converting methanol to dimethyl ether, which you then convert into aromatics and the paraffins. So aromatics are like toluene and benzene. You don't want as many of those, for example, so you have to stop it at the right point. It's actually getting good weather. If you go too far, you know what you don't want. Okay, but basically these are also highly exothermic, so you keep losing energy all along the way, right? So we started with coal or biomass, we lose energy to make the methanol, we lose energy to make the dimethyl ether, we lose energy to make the gasoline, right? So what you end up with is a lot less energy than you started with, so it takes a lot, a lot of coal. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, if I go back to this dimethyl ether, uh, this is how the Nazis made diesel for their panzers in uh, World War II. So this, this old Nazi technology to start. <coughs> okay, so basically, um, so this is an existing process in New Zealand. It's the biggest in the world right now. And Exxon Mobil's doing it. And basically, they take they just purchase methanol and they ship it in. Um, and basically, they just they pump it up to high pressure and they send it to our uh, dimethyl ether reactor. Um, so this just makes dimethyl ether and this goes through a second reactor. There's actually a series of a bunch of parallel trains just there completely designed. They make uh, the gasoline for it, uh, and then they just do a bunch of pre you know, heating, heat exchange. So everything else is heat, it gets reactor separation with some heat exchange that just you throw around there for efficiency. And then basically that's it. You just get this mix of hydrocarbons that um, they sort of separate into a gas, which they can use for something else, or flare it, or use it for power for this plant. Um, the water phase, and then they have the oil phase, basically, like the gasoline phase. This goes into fractionation, so that's another whole story, but converting it into different blends. So they can get like their 87 octane, their 89, you know, the 92, and then jet fuel and kerosene and all that stuff. So you can actually do all that stuff from, from the, the petroleum refining, so it's the classic refining. And so what you end up with is this is showing um, you have paraffins, aromatics at the top, and then you have some olefins, it's the little one, the, the 210 cycle paraffins. So the paraffins are pretty much what we want. Um, and this is conventional gasoline, and then the, the methanol derived gasoline is really, really close. In this category. So you can basically use it to it. Which is actually pretty impressive that this, this, these are blends of maybe 600 different chemicals to get the right mixture. The balance set is actually pretty impressive. So um, that's pretty much what I want to talk about in terms of uh, state of the art. There's some competing processes which do essentially the same thing in some slightly different ways. But the point is, is that there's a huge growing market now for methanol because they're getting better and better than synthetic gasoline. And they want to do this because this is how we can make gasoline from other sources. So if we don't want as much oil, if oil is too high, it makes sense to do it for something cheap like coal. <coughs> and you can do it for natural gas too. So, you, so this, this gas prices are really, really low. Um, gas to gasoline is now big news. Um, it's a huge, 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 huge refinery in uh, Malaysia that's been constructed to natural gas to gasoline. It's basically the same thing. We just produce this from natural gas instead of coal. Okay, so any questions on the, the commerce before I talk about the actual politics or the, uh, the process? <coughs> okay, well, I forgot my Dr. Pepper today. <coughs> okay, so there's your context. Okay, so if we go to the actual project flow, what we're going to focus on is the conversion of our base fuel, which is solid in this case, so it's either coal or biomass. We're going to try to get some methanol for sale. Okay, so the process, so many chemical processes are sequential. Each individual box might be very complex, but overall it's just a basic collection of stuff. Oh, thanks. Yeah, okay. That's good. 
So this can be done from coal or biomass or some mix. Basically anything that was once a plant recently or a very long time ago. Okay. So something with carbon and hydrogen and oxygen all mixed together in a solid. Okay, and our, what we're doing is we're going to use something called gasification to create what's called syn, syn gas or synthesis gas. It's basically hydrogen, CO, those have energy, and then other stuff which is waste. Okay. So the idea is we convert our solid, which has energy in the different bonds of the solid, into gases which have energy in the bonds of the gas. So we move the energy from one form to another. All right, to do this we need a high purity oxygen supply, so this unit here will take air and basically it's cryogenic, it's like ultra cold, like negative 110C, and basically separate out nitrogen and oxygen in a liquid distillation form. Really, really cool. Okay, so we need pure oxygen to do this, all right, and then we get syngas, but it's in the wrong um, ratio. So basically what we need, if you look at the methanol let's see here, synthesis reaction, it's two hydrogens for one CO to make a methanol molecule. <coughs> okay, so we basically want to get that balance, a two to one ratio by mole, and that's the trick. All right, so we need this balance to make it work. And the problem is when we do gasification, we get much less hydrogen than we need. All right, so this next step, hydrogen upgrading and shifting, is basically to, to put more hydrogen in it, and I'll show how that works in a minute. We basically change the ratio so we have the right ratio of hydrogen to CO. We basically add water, pull the oxygen off the water, and that gives us our hydrogen. Okay. All right, so now we have shifted syngas, which means it's the right balance. And we just need to remove the water that we need to add. We have excess water, so we've got to get out some water. The extra water produced here and fed here. Okay, and then we need to clean. So coal is dirty, right? There's a lot of nasty stuff in there, a lot of metals we don't want, a lot of just sulfur and... and uh, uh, other stuff that we don't want in there. The other thing we don't want is CO2. Okay. Environment aside, we have to get rid of the CO2 from our syngas because we want just hydrogen and CO to go to our methanol synthesis. Any CO2 um, causes problems. Either it's just it's in there, you're not doing anything, and you're paying for all that space, and make everything bigger to account for it, um, or in most cases, depending on the catalyst, it will actually CO2 will will um, will form a solid carbon. So you'll actually get oxygen in a solid C. So you get carbon deposition, it's called. And so you basically have carbon black. Just fill everything, block all of your spaces, and then everything stops working. You basically kill it, kill it all off. Okay. So you pretty much have to get the CO2 out of here. So we basically have to clean it up. So if you get rid of the sulfur, if you get rid of some of the other chemicals, get rid of the CO2. So we'll talk about how that works. And then once you do this, you finally can actually make your methanol. So that's just your methanol synthesis. So just one reactor, one catalyst, or maybe a parallel sequence. It's one easy step. Everything else builds around this. So we can get our methanol out, our waste gases. Okay, we'll have to separate uh, our products to purify them. But our waste gases, we can then do something with. So this is you know leftover hydrogen CO um, or some waste gases that are produced. And it still has a lot of energy in it. We don't want to just waste it. So we're actually going to blow this up in a combustion turbine. Um, and that will produce electricity and some waste heat. So this will produce some power and then we have hot exhaust that's left over. So we actually use a heat recovery and steam generation system to produce steam for the rest of our process. We take that heat, add water to make steam, and then that's steam we need for upstream. We also have enough left over for even more power. Okay, so we have another power plant here. So we have two, two power production places. All right, and then we can finally send this out to the atmosphere. So when this is finally combusted, this is water and CO2 that's left. So one other option, I don't know if you're gonna cover this option, is that, is that if you do get the CO2, typically right now we just vent it, but if we wanna actually capture this and sequester it so it doesn't go in the air, we have to do something special. So that's a separate step. I'm not, are you doing that one? Okay, so that is covered, so we'll talk about it. Okay. All right, any general questions on the, the general idea? Right, so we're just kind of following the path of carbon. So like this is carbon and hydrogen here. We just sort of change the, the carbon leaves some of it leaves here in CO2, the rest ends up as our methanol. Right? We want to have as little CO2 as possible with as much carbon end up as methanol as possible. That's our yield. Right? And our energy goes this way too. And our energy comes out here, any of the waste energy comes leaves here as power. So it's pretty much a straight line with some supporting carbon.
All right. So I'm going to go through some of the different the different steps. Um, so the very first thing is called gasification. So this is sort of the fundamental unit. This has been around for about 80 years. It's, it's an art form. Each one of these suckers is maybe eight stories tall. Okay. Um, they're sort of the lifeblood of any plant that produces say, gas from coal or natural gas. Okay. So this was this was the Nazi invention in the 30s um, that they were able to make uh, their gas produced from coal. Okay. So fundamentally, what we do with gasification is we we take. Um, our solid, if we put it in there, we use, in this case, it's, it's brought in by a water slurry, so it's, it's um, just a water stream with all the, the pulverized coal mixed in, so we just push it in that way, it's the conveyance method. We need water anyway. <coughs> we use high purity oxygen. Okay, and what the oxygen does is it, it, it's, um, it get, if there's just enough oxygen to burn up a tiny portion of the, of the coal, because we need really, really high temperature. So, uh, maybe up to 1,400 degrees C. Okay, it's nasty. Um, and uh, so it's, we're not burning all of it, right? Because the more we burn, the more energy we waste. We don't want that. Okay? So we need to have just enough oxygen to bring it up to some high temperature, and we need some more oxygen to the actual conversion. But we basically convert carbon to CO, and the hydrogen parts in the water is converted to H2. So that's where that, that comes from. Right? And so this comes down uh, the uh, gasifier zone. And basically for our purposes, we have this ultra hot gas that comes down into what's called a dip tube. And this is basically just a tube that you just blow your gas, just comes down in this pool of water called a quench pool. Okay? So it's just a pool of water. And you blow the gases in here so that it just speed cools everything. Right? There's two good reasons for this. Um, one is that they have to cool it down, and it's really, really hot. So you just put in this pool of water that can guarantee you get basically um, uh, your raw product at a certain temperature. It's got water in it, saturated water. Okay, and it's also a cooling mechanism because I can just pull this out and cool it. So it's an easy way to actually cool this thing. Remember, okay, this is so hot we can't like even stick a thermocouple in there to see how hot it is because they'll just burn the thermocouple. So this is actually a really, really, really nasty piece. So it, for this case, it's just practically everything. Okay, so fundamentally what we have coming out of here is hydrogen, CO, and water. And then um, solids like uh, iron and metals that are in the coal. So they burn up and they become iron oxide or sulfur oxide, I'm sorry, or silicon oxide or aluminum oxide, right? And they actually come out of here uh, is what's called slag, and we haven't really drawn it for this flow sheet. But one of the, re the other reasons we do that is because we need to get the solids and separate them from the gas. So they actually fall down by gravity. There's a device, like a hopper, which collects it, and then you can do stuff with that. Um, but it's just a way to separate the, the gas from the solid. Okay, the model is basically, I'm going to go to the model details, or just go with the process. Okay, so don't worry about how it's modeled. Um, how many of you actually did this? I know about half of you. Yeah, okay, so those of you that have this, if I remember some of the model. Um, okay. So the next step, so we're at box number two now. Let's see here. Okay. So we've got air separation, that's how we got our oxygen, we've done gasification. So now we're going to look at this step here, the shifting. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to convert syn gas, which has about one mole of hydrogen, one mole of CO in that ratio. We want to get to two moles of hydrogen, one mole of CO. So the fundamental reaction which does that is called the water gas shift reaction. And this is really old. This is actually how we used to make um, town gas, it was called, so natural gas in your homes. But in the old days, like 1880s, you could get town gas in your home. You use that to light your lamps and that kind of part of it. And they would gasify coal, they'd shift it a little bit, and then they would deliver it to you. But it turned out it's really dangerous because the CO would kill everybody if you actually left the lamp on or something. Okay, so they don't do that anymore. So what they do is they use this reaction. They basically take the CO, which has energy, you add water, all right, and over a particular catalyst, they react to form CO2 and hydrogen. Okay, and it's called a shift because the energy, like CO has energy, and basically a small amount comes off as heat, and the rest is shifted onto the hydrogen. Okay, so you go from energy on the carbon compound to energy on the hydrogen. And so the CO2 is waste, has no energy. So that's why it's called water gas shift. The water is gas phase, right? Shift. Okay, so the problem is we want to go to two to one exactly 
And that's actually really hard to control from a reaction point of view. Okay, so we stick this in a reactor. It might be 2.15, because it's going to depend on the length of time it's in there, right? So you have to sort of size this exactly so it exactly hits the proportion you want. And that's almost impossible to control because it's going to be actually fluctuating its conversion all the time, right? My conversion is going to go like this all the time. So it's going to fluctuate. It's really, really hard to control that. And slight changes in temperature, pressure, water amounts completely change the conversion. So what they do is they build a, re or a reactor that's going to be too big always, and they just divert a portion of it around. Okay, and they can use a controller that says, okay, how far did my reaction go? It's going to be too far. Maybe it goes to three to one. And then they can calculate, okay, at this point in time, I need to divert this much around it of the weaker stuff so it blends in just the right amount. Okay, so this is really for control purposes. Okay, you have, you have a controller that will monitor this composition, all right, and then divert this in just the right amount in real time to make sure the blend stays at two to one. The reason you have another reactor here is because we have to convert this waste product, COS, carbonosulfide. Okay, we have to convert that to CO2 and hydrogen sulfide because downstream, it's way easier to clean up hydrogen sulfide than hydrogen than COS. Okay, so any, if we divert a walk around the water gas shift reactor, we still have to do this step. Okay, so that's why it's there. Right, so the point is, at the end of this, all we have hydrogen sulfide and then our properly shifted signals. Tom, does the COS come from the gas yeah, so this, this originates from the sulfur that's locked in with the coal. And so when you gasify it, you get COX. Um, you have, like, that's just what, one of the main products. And so we have to convert that, because this is really hard to capture. This is a lot easier. Does it reduce COX when you use biomass as opposed to coal? No, that would depend on the sulfur content of the biomass. OK, so um, in general, the biomass would have a lower sulfur content, that's true. And many coals are, don't have a lot of, like some coals have a lot of sulfur, some might not have any sulfur. So this highly depends on your feed stuff for sure. Okay, so the next section I'm not, I didn't want to talk about it, but basically, uh, the next step is to remove water. Yeah, Korea. Sorry, what is ROS and gas? Okay, ROS and gas. Okay, so the terminology, so these are just some standard terms. So raw means it comes right out of the gasifier. You haven't done anything to it yet. Okay, so it's still got all the garbage in it. You haven't changed it. What is it? What is it? <coughs> What's in it? <coughs> so you have H2, CO, CO2, water, COS, um, some H2S, and then you also will have things like chlorine and ammonia um, and uh, maybe mercury. I was sort of skipping those cleanups, but those would also come. Yeah. Um, and then the topic is COS hydrolysis reactor. That's the only reaction that's happening, so you're not converting any of the, the um, uh, carbon monoxide in that top reactor? That's correct. So the point is, we're going to overdo it here because it's easier to, like, you, you just give it a target that's higher, so it's always overdone. Right? So we're going to do both. So the thing is, is this, these catalysts will have dual function, so you actually put two catalysts mixed together. So you do both reactions in this one. So that all the COS gets converted. Okay. And then you just, you know, some of the CO gets converted here, none of it at the top, so you mix it. Yeah, so it's for control, so you can blend it exactly correct. Okay, so there are all good questions. Um, okay, so for the cleanup steps, uh, we skip this for 3G. But basically, so shifted syngas means we've done the shifting now, so it's balanced. Okay, but it's not finished because we still have stuff to clean it. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm, um, for this thing, I just said uh, we had some pretty simple water removal. I think I told you how to, didn't tell you how to do it in this, but you just cool it down and you condense out the water. Okay, so you just bring it down to, I think about 220, 210, because this is ultra high pressure, so this is 54 bar. So the boiling point of water, the dew point at that point is in the 200, low 200. So you just cool it down to that point, and then the water comes out. And with the water comes the ammonia as well, and some sulfur. Okay, so that's why this is called sour water, because it's got sulfur in it. Okay, not all the sulfur, but um, I can't remember who decided for this one was going to um, model it or not. But I think what I was doing is I was getting around all the steps, because you just have to deal with lots of little 
cool down, flash it out, drum pads, coolers and flash it out. I think at the time we had to put it together so. Okay, but most of the sulfur stays in the sink gas, and then the next step is the CO2 and water hydrogen sulfide. Okay. So in this case, we take our shifted sink gas, we're going to get the CO2 out, we get the sulfur out, hydrogen sulfide. And to do this, we're using a solvent. Okay, we're using an um, absorption cycle, a pressure swing absorption in this case. Okay, so what we do is our, there's a solvent, this is a monodiethyl, monodiethanol amine. Okay, it's, there's many different kinds you can use, but it's a solvent which is good for both CO2 and H2S. Okay, it just happens to be good for both. And it's not good for collecting hydrogen and CO. Right, which is exactly what we want, right? So we're gonna we're gonna blow this up a series of columns. So here's our, our, our I call this dry sink gas. So now it's shifted and dehydrated. We've taken the water, so now it's dry. Okay, so we have H2, CO, CO2, H2S. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna contact it basically with this solvent. And as it contacts the solvent, the hydrogen and CO2 will continue to bubble up. As the solvent falls down the liquid, it collects the CO2 and the hydrogen sulfide. So that's how we're going to separate it. It's standard absorption. So in this case, we have two stages. Um, because one interesting thing about this is um, it'll get all the, the sulfur sort of gets picked up first. Okay, so what we actually do is we put the, at the we basically think of this as one big column with a, a side stream pulled out. Okay. So we put our solvent at the top, and that's going to fall down as our gas flows up this way. Okay? And in this portion, it takes the sulfur really quickly. Okay, so at the bottom, all the sulfur is gone. And so we take that sulfur, and we've done just a little bit. Okay, and so this is going to come down, and we can recover the sulfur part. And then as it goes up the top, we get more solvent. The CO2 is picked up at the later. So we get the CO2, we can just pull the stream off that has CO2 in it this way. Okay, and there will be CO2 in the stream, of course. Um, but basically, so it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense intuitively. But what you get is basically coming out the top now, we have just H2 and CO. Yeah, okay. So just H2 and CO coming out the top. And then our solvent, we have solvent with CO2 here. And here we have solvent with CO2 and uh, sulfur. Now I have magic CO2 removal because for 3G I didn't want to mess with this because it just creates a lot of problem. This is um, actually a stripping column with a series of pumps and compressors to handle pressure. But we add a little bit of nitrogen and sin gas in a particular mixture at a lower, little bit lower pressure, actually a lot lower pressure, one bar. All right, and that'll pull, and that actually goes back into here. So we have a device which will bring the CO2 and put it back up here so it doesn't end up coming this far. And it's not, it's not a huge unit, it's just a real nasty piece to see it, so we just threw that out of it. Okay, so that's why it's a magic CO2 separator. What really happens is this CO2 actually goes back up and ends up coming out that way. So it's a way of keeping the CO2 out. And then we have basically H2S in, in, our, in our solvent, so we just use a classic distillation column. Okay, and we're basically at low pressure, we're going to boil off all of that hydrosulfide that's stuck in. Okay, and we actually get water with it, so water, there's still water um, here, a little bit left, and there's actually water mixed in with our solvents, not pure solvent. So we get water with our hydrogen sulfide, we get a wastewater treatment, and then we take our MDEA, which is now pure, and then that gets recycled again back up to the top. Okay. So for the CO2, this is also this is pressure uh, driven, so it, it's enough to just flash, do one flash to get out. Um, at medium pressure, this guy gets out any hydrogen and CO that we didn't want captured. Okay, so this first thing just puts it back in there, so that by this point there's no hydrogen and CO captured by accident. And then another flash of low pressure will get the CO2 off, and then we just have to repump our methanol, our, our uh, amine back up there. Okay, so it's kind of a complicated process, but we just have this solvent loop and pressure swing, two separate loops basically. Okay, and then we end up with our, our syn gas, which has the, the right problem. Okay. So this is um, this is actually how we produce CO2 for soft drinks. Okay, so I have my Dr. Pepper. I'll show you, but we make it from coal. 
All right? And we use something like this to capture CO2. Get, to get it. So. Um, okay, so now we're moving on down. So at this point, I probably should have labeled this differently, but this is just H2 and CO in the right amount. Okay, that's where we're at right now. All right, so now we're downstream in methanol synthesis box. Okay, so what we do is it's just a reactor, and everything else is basically some separation and heat exchange. Okay, so we basically go through, we have to heat it up to about 225C. Okay, so that's what this is doing. All right, and we do our reaction. All right, we just put our two hydrogens and CO together into one. Right, what happens on the surface of the catalyst? They literally just, the CO sits at one site, fits right there, the two hydrogens come next to it, and then they just rebond and it comes off the surface. So the surface is designed of the right shape to make them sit together at just the right angles and the right angles. All right? So now we have our product, which is going to be leftover um, CO and H2, because this might only have about 30% conversion in reality. This entire thing is based around a catalyst, which is maybe 30% conversion. Okay, so we have methanol in the vapor phase. We're just doing cooling. We cool it. We just do two stages because this is really high temperature, so I can make steam, I don't have to use cooling water, I can make something that I ball that waste heat, and then I'll use cooling water to cool it down. We flash the lower pressure, and we get our waste gases, and then our methanol, basically. So we get 95% pure methanol here, and then our waste gases, a portion we can purge, a portion we can recycle. We can't recycle 100%, because through this entire thing, from all the way in the beginning, we actually have just a little bit of nitrogen coming in because you can't get high purity, ultra high purity oxygen. So you will not get 100% oxygen. All right, you'll get, at the best, you can do 99.5% oxygen. Right? You can do that, um, and which is actually what you designed for this. All right, that nitrogen, basically through this whole process, is going to end up coming into methanol synthesis. All right, coming through the reactor, it doesn't do anything gets to here, it comes up, and we have to give it an escape route. It needs a way to leave. All right, so we can recycle as much as we can, but that nitrogen will build up unless we have some percentage purge. All right, at steady state, it has to have an escape route. Otherwise, nitrogen will just keep looping here until it explodes, until you run out. Or other stuff, bad stuff can happen. Right? So we have to have this escape route. So that goes to purge. And then the liquid portion is just our methanol. So now we're just going to basically purify it. So there's a little bit of waste gas because, you know, a flash drum isn't a high pressure separation. It does a lot of the job for you. So we just use distillation to basically clean off the rest of it. So now we have our, our pure methanol to sale. We can get ultra high purity. Waste gases to flu, and then we have our purge. Okay, so downstream, this is what we can do with our purge gas, is we can just basically blow it up. Alright, so you have a question for Well, just, is the purge the only spot where the nitrogen is going to exit, or would some come out like when we're getting rid of the water further? So, you will have some nitrogen converted to ammonia, and you will lose it through your water removal. Um, but for the most part, this is the first gas exit. Okay. okay. So, a, a very small portion of nitrogen could be released here, and will, okay, um, or here. But we choose MDEA and use it for many things because it actually doesn't pick up nitrogen either. Okay, so it won't pick up very much. But definitely not enough. So, most of the so the purge is the majority of it. The purge is ascent almost all will almost be all, maybe ninety-five percent. Okay. So in a gas combustion turbine, um, basically what we do is you take air you compress to the high compressor. We have air cooling stages because you, you, it gets too high with the compressor because it produces a lot of heat. So um, you have to keep cooling it, and then you just blow it up, and then you spin it over a, uh, a turbine. Let me show you what one looks like, actually. Uh, okay, this is a, a seed and gas turbine. It's used for this purpose, taking our waste hydrogen and CO, blowing it up to make electricity. Okay, there's a big market for this. All right, so this is your main expander. Okay, so the gas would flow this way. These are different stages of compressor for the air portion of it. We would inject the fuel here after we compress the air, and then we blow it up in this thing. Okay, you can see these different stages. These different blades correspond with different stages, and there's intercooling working inside the blades themselves and in between these little pipes of coolant. 
flow in and out. Like that. Okay, so it's a very, very beautiful piece of equipment. So it's usually it's all one piece, all right. And as far as Aspen is concerned, um, we basically just use one box for all the compression and cooling, and then one box for the blowing up part. That's the R gives reactor. Uh, but basically, we just blow it up and spin it and get power from this. Thing. So that's that's the modeling perspective. But that's how we get a lot of electricity. So I keep going. Um, that covers most of everything uh, that we talked about for the system. So I go back here. What I've left out was this, where you can take that, after we combust it, we have a hot waste. So that thing leaving that turbine, it might still be 600 degrees C. Right? So after we produce electricity, we have a, a, low, bar, a low pressure, because this is still like 50 bar. All right, we go from 50 to 1. That's a lot of pressure difference we can drive a turbine. It's great. But it's still high temperature, so we actually use a bunch of heat react heat exchangers to make steam. All right, so at really the really hot stuff you can make high pressure steam, and then the next one you can make low medium pressure steam, then you can make low pressure steam, then you can make boiler feed water, right, and then you have to cool the rest down before you. So, so you can make utilities, and any extra steam that you don't need at all these other places, um, you can use for additional power in the steam turbine. So that's like old school power. Okay, um, so that is a super fun rundown of coal and methanol. So the difference between coal and biomass, all right, fundamentally, it's solids handling. Because the gasifier itself, you'll buy a different kind of gasifier for the two. All right? But you basically, what you do with the biomass <coughs> is you have to dry it, you have to like heat it up so the water gets out, and then you have to sort of chip it, so you put it in the chips, if it's like wood, you style it, for example. And then you got to pulverize it so you get little tiny pellets. So you basically make it look like coal. Right? That's basically what you're doing. So you can turn it into charcoal. There's all the stuff you can do. And the other thing is, is that it's usually wet, much lower energy density. So your gasifier itself won't get up to as high of a, a temperature. You won't get as much syngas as a result. And you have other waste things that you have to deal with. Because actually the bio has more junk than the mountain. So um, it's actually less efficient and it's harder to do it. Um, now for our assignment we did in 3G, I just, we just pretended they were the same thing. It's not really like that. We said the only difference was cost. Um, but basically if we do this whole thing from biomass, what you have is a biofuel, you have biomethane. So it's the same basic idea, it's just your feedstocks. So, okay, so it's five minutes for questions that I haven't already been answered. Um, a lot there. It's a big process, right? A lot of heat streams, lots of little bits. Um, I don't think there's anything. Yeah, I forgot to mention you need really high pressure steam here for a steam kit. Yeah. What are you doing here? A kit class. Oh. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's not really related to the flow sheet, but the, at least with the gas part, has there been any state estimation done on that? Any what? State estimation. You mean for uh, understanding the internals of the gasifier? There are plenty of plenty of models that people try to handle. Mm. Um, it's so he's he's referring to the fact that it's so nasty you can't really measure what's going on. It's basically a giant solid mass explosion at ultra high temperature that lasts less than a second. Okay, and but there's no flame, so it's not it's not it's not arsenic. It's, just, it's nasty, but. Yeah, he's asking if people have used special models to figure out what's inside and say, yes, people are guessing very well. Yeah? Where is that biomass coming from? Is it actually... Well, that's up to you. Um, it could be, you know, alligator fat. It could be... Uh, there's a huge market for alligator fat, by the way. Um, Generally, I think for this type of wood chips, which is so like this whole food versus fuel issue, and every biomass can have a different quality, some will gasify better. I think wood is the closest that we would use compared to coal. Um, anything that used to be alive, some won't work though. Yeah. You would use like a very digestive or like a lot of 
the question is, can we use wastewater sludge? In general, you would able to do something to take the solids out. You could potentially use that gasification. That is a very low heat value. It's hard to get up to high heat. Okay, so the, pro the question is, what is the project? So the project is based on this flow sheet. Each group will have somewhat of a different focus on a different region of the flow sheet, but your aim is for all groups will be costing of these capital cost items, utility costs, raw material costs, selling price costs, so you've got to be money flowing in, money flowing out, you'll be taking account depreciation, taxes, you'll be calculating NPV and profitability analysis. So that's the, the, the economic side that we've been covering so far in the course. Then we'll be starting with the safety topic in a week and a half from now. So and we'll be looking at that for the next two, three weeks. So we'll be looking at flaring and, and safety aspects, hazard and operability studies. And this is where the groups will start to differ because I will assign different groups to do a hazard and operability study on a different part of the flow sheet. So everyone will be doing economics um, on most of the flow sheet. And then every, uh, each group will be doing a different hazard and operability study. Then there's also the operability topic, which we look at control repairing, operating windows, uh, maintenance on, on different units, why we have split units, parallel pumps. And there again, each group will have a slightly different focus. Okay, but same, same flow sheets, starting point. So you all have the same Aspen simulation to start from, the same um, throughput through the process for every group. So you, you're all on the equal footing on that point, but your focus area might be. Difference. And so I'll I'll have a memo on that on the course website.